Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fire and Forte and this incredible sustainability week and an incredible guest who's with us today. Rosanna Ayacano is the founder of Growth Activists, which I'm going to let her do the brilliant job of introducing it. Good morning, Rosanna, and thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Good morning, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we are a strategy and engagement consultancy that is really focused in the sustainability field. So our job is really to work with organisations on their sustainability transformation and then help them really tell that story to all of their different stakeholders. We've been going for about five years now. And Anne, am I right in thinking that it is focused on B Corp and is that assisting businesses before they get B Corp certified or after or both? Yeah, so assisting businesses with their B Corp certification is definitely one of our biggest practice, bigger practice areas. And we have five B Lab trained B consultants on the team that are helping a whole range of different businesses on their B Corp journeys. What B Lab, so B Lab is the certifying body and B Corp is the certification. What B Lab found was that businesses were really struggling to, it's it's a really hard certification to achieve. The average business, when they go through the business impact assessment on their own or on, online, will usually achieve somewhere between 40 and 60 points. But to certify, you need to be over 80 points. So it means you need to have some pretty exceptional practices in place. And a lot of businesses were a little bit overwhelmed by that first go at it and found some of the questions hard to decipher. So our role in the B Corp certification process is really to do the handholding all the way through and help businesses discover all of the different practices, procedures, policies that they can put in place in order to make it to the 80 plus points. And generally we get them well over the 80 points because our job, I, I guess, you know, our strategic point of difference at the growth activists is that we help them also discover areas of ESG strategy that are really intrinsic to their business model and where they can be really exceptional and leading. And I think that takes a little bit of prodding and pushing and provocation, but that's what we're really good at. So uh, yeah, we'd like to think that not only do we help these businesses achieve certification, but they also discover what their true ESG strategic pillars are for the organization, which creates a fantastic storytelling opportunity on the back end to really engage all their stakeholders. Absolutely. And I imagine that some businesses are so big, they may not understand or have a full appreciation of the processes and procedures that are happening in an other area of the business. Do you find that? Is it easier maybe in smaller businesses than bigger ones? Look, I think the challenges are different for, for small versus large businesses. You know, in small businesses, it's very often just lacking the resources to put all of the measurements, policies, procedures in place. I mean, one of the things to remain, remember with a certification that's fully audited like the B Corp certification, we use the catchphrase, no proof, no points. So everything needs to be very, very thoroughly documented in advance of it being audited. And that's where small businesses struggle the most. With large businesses, yes, very often it is. They just have disparate functions that are operating across different parts of ESG. When you look at governance, very often that sits with finance and legal. When you look at some of the social impact areas, like community impact, some of it will sit with marketing or product. Sometimes it'll sit with procurement as well. And then environment sits across a whole range of different functions as well. So just pulling all of that together in a coordinated way is something that large businesses really appreciate having a structured process on, which is something that we've developed and, and we've taken them through. So, you know, we've taken very large businesses, like the largest we've taken through is, is First Century Investors. They're Australia's second biggest wealth manager after Macquarie Group. So they're, they're a bit of a behemoth. So taking them through the process was, was amazing. But we're, we've also taken, you know, small designer businesses through the process, even micro businesses. So we really love that range of different organizations, but their challenges are all different. And so we tailor the program, the transformation program and the project management to where to meet them where they are. Excellent, because it's about finding out where to get all of this information from. And I think it's fascinating the unique 
story that they've got to tell as well, because that's often something that everyone can stand behind proudly for if they work at a business, if it's the procurement, the way that they treat their teams, if it's the supply chain, you'll have much better examples than I've got. But I think it's something to really celebrate in an organization. I'm going to come back and ask you about some of those because I thought it might be helpful for people listening that are not as close to B Corp certification. In your view, what is so good about B Corp certification in the world of sustainability and what you're trying to do? And how would you briefly describe what B Corp actually is? Okay, so I'll start with the description of what it is. It is, I think, the most comprehensive whole of business ESG certification, which means it's very, very broad. It has five key areas that it covers. It covers governance, customer, environment, community, and workers. So it's very, very comprehensive. And as I mentioned before, it is a fully audited process. So that makes it quite quite a challenge to for businesses to document their evidence around everything that they have in place. And the other thing that makes it quite unique or at least a little bit different to you know some of the other efforts that are happening out there from an ESG standpoint is that it's multi-stakeholder oriented. So a lot of organizations are really doing a a decent job and sometimes a very good job in reporting ESG, primarily for the investor community, particularly listed companies. You know, there's more, we're moving more and more towards mandatory disclosures. You know, we'll probably see a lot of regulation start to really come out in the, in the next six to 12 months around mandatory reporting. But I think what's really important to remember is that a lot of this reporting is still primarily for the financial or investor community so that they have insights into the risks, specifically of you know of the organizations that they're, they're placing investments in. And, and what is great about B Corp is that it is considering all stakeholders. It's really thinking about how you're creating value for a bigger group of stakeholders. And I think, yeah, it, it just makes it a little bit more, more powerful because my view, and, and it's something that we've seen over and over, is that when you are really thinking about the value that you're creating as an organization for all of your different stakeholders, and you align all of them behind your strategy, you know, you're creating value for them, you actually get an amazing exponential tailwind at your back. You know, you've got everybody that's really behind you and cheering for you. And and the flip side of that is actually the disruption that you might get from activism. You can have shareholder activists, you can have employee activists, you can have environmental activists. So it's so much better to have a fully aligned model where you're considering all of those stakeholders And then just, you know, some of the benefits that we're seeing organizations get on the back end, apart from that excellent alignment with employees, they are definitely getting higher levels of attraction, retention and engagement. And I think that's so important in the current talent war. It's just such a, or, you know, the war that we have had in the last sort of six, 12 months. So it's an amazing competitive advantage for businesses. It also puts them into more of an innovation mindset. Because they're really forced to think about, well, what will my business look like in a circular economy? What will my business look like? What does my infrastructure need to be to be a net zero business by 2030 or 2040 or whatever that goal might be? So I think that innovation mindset is really important. I think it also creates collaboration. One of the things that I've seen B Corps do once they join the community is really network with each other. There's a lot of best practice sharing. The whole notion of open sourcing IP becomes re- really comes alive. So that, that's pretty cool. I think there are really great governance outcomes as well because it forces boards to really step it up in terms of their reporting and to be across a, a wider range of topics and issues. So I think it actually creates better board competency. And then the last one is financial. I mean, it's a really, it's a, you know, it is often the biggest driver for a lot of organizations, but businesses that have really strong ESG credentials and then have the proof uh, of that practice being in place through something like B Corp actually have access to better terms. There's a whole bunch of sustainability linked loans out there, but also investors, you know, from VCs to private equity, they're increasingly looking for trust marks in businesses that have good ESG practice and the B Corp certification is that as well. So there's a whole plethora of benefits. 
I'm really interested in everything you explained, but particularly love the fact that if you're reporting and ultimately being audited on some of these areas, you need to be you need to be providing a certain standard and maintaining a certain standard in one of those areas. So that maintains a sustainable practice, I imagine. But when you mentioned innovation mindset, it must spur on the business to actually find new solutions. Is that what you're seeing those two working quite well together? Definitely. You know, definitely. They, they are absolutely thinking about how they, you know, how they need to, to keep evolving their operating models. I think it can be quite enlightening for them to see what good looks like from a standard standpoint and where those points are allocated. There's something within the business, the, the BIA, the Business Impact Assessment, which is, you know, this fantastic online resource that has over 200 questions, which is what, you know, the whole, I guess, assessment is made up of. Um, it's got this really amazing inclusion called impact business models, where businesses get these supercharged points for doing something that is very uh, unique, leading and differentiated in the market. And it's a way for businesses to actually, in going through that and navigating, you know, navigating the assessment, they discover the things that are regarded as being, you know, leading and being high impact. So yeah, it really makes them think about, well, you know, if that's, if that's regarded as good, is this something that we should be embedding into the way that we operate? So yeah, it sparks a lot of thinking around innovation and future business models. As a consumer, I think it's very reassuring to know that the diligence behind ESG is there. And because I think, unfortunately, the media talk a lot about greenwashing and that can make people lose trust. But to know that actually these organizations and B Corp is becoming incredibly well known, isn't it, from small brands to bigger brands, to know what that stands for and to know that you can trust that you're buying into something, into a business that's doing the right things. Definitely. I think I think it is a really important trust mark. And I think there's a whole ecosystem of different trust marks. The great thing about B Corp is it is a whole of business certification. But I think consumers are increasingly looking for product certifications as well, you know, whether it's fair trade or whether it's a got organic cotton on a t-shirt or whatever it might be. You know, there is a there is a whole ecosystem and having those proof points in place are really important in the face of greenwashing. But I think what's also really important important to remember that once you get that certification, you know, there have definitely been instances of businesses that have worked up to the 80 points and they've gotten the cert certification and then it's been a little bit of set and forget. And it's like, okay, let's, let's not think about it until, you know, the next three years. So you need to recertify every three years. And then they discover that the standards, which are actually dynamic, have kept getting harder and they're not going to get across the line. So I think what's really important is to bring those principles to life in the organization to really extract all of those benefits that I talked about before, like employee engagement and, you know, incredible collaboration. You have to really live those principles and bring them to life and think about your continuous improvement plan as well and, and how you're going to have that ongoing positive impact. Otherwise, businesses, you know, they can certainly achieve the, the certification and then be greenwashing by actually not doing anything in terms of ongoing improvement. I think I think the big thing with ESG is that there is no finish line. I think it's really important to, to remember that it's not, you know, there is definitely no set and forget with, with ESG work. So... And such a lost opportunity to not celebrate it. So during Fire and Forte Sustainability Week, we've been talking to people in renewable energy. We've been talking to platform owners that manage carbon emissions for small to medium businesses, ethical fashion, L lots of women leading in, in amazing initiatives. And they're so engaging. You want to celebrate these things because actually to your point around networking with other people who are B Corp certified, if everyone in the sustainability space does that and the sustainability space should be everybody, then the, the planet does benefit from that, doesn't it? And the energy that you get from seeing a brand celebrate their B Corp could really cascade. Definitely, 100%, I agree. And have you got some favorite brands, whether you work with them yet or not, that you think have 
maybe executed their B Corp certification really well, that as well many people might know of? Yeah, look, there are so many. Look, I, I think the really obvious one, I, I will use it, is Patagonia. I think they have done such an exceptional job. Now, I think the first time that they certified, they've recertified four times now, so they were in an early B Corp. Every time they've recertified, their points have jumped up by another 10 points, another 15 points. So I think they're sitting around the 160-something point mark at the moment, which is fantastic. And it means that every time they've recertified, they've embedded new practices into their operating model that enable, to, uh, enable them to get those supercharged impact business model points. So they've really, they've really walked the talk on it, on, on being part of the community. They're also very... They live those principles of sharing their learnings with others. Another great organization is All Birds. I recently had a chance to have a conversation with their CMO and they actually offer consulting to other B Corps and other businesses on their sustainable product journey and circularity journey. So I'm really excited to see some of those practices come into play. In Australia, one of our amazing clients is BASIC who certified recently, beautiful designer, luxury basics or, you know, premium basics brand. For those that don't know, it's the one that's spelled B-A-S-S-I-K-E. So basic are amazing. They do so much of their production in Australia and their impact has been about creating local economic prosperity in local communities. So just, you know, in the way that they have, structured their manufacturing, they've had this enormous impact. So yeah, there's, there's a whole whole range of businesses that are doing wonderful things and where the B Corp certification has either helped them discover where they already have impact and they can continually optimize that impact and really go pedal to the metal and, and get an even bigger effect or help them discover where they can be stronger and, and can have a greater impact and it's areas they haven't been thinking about before. So, yeah, I mean, even first centia investors, the way that they really reviewed their investment po policy and, you know, where they put their clients' money, that was, that was a really, really powerful signal to the rest of the financial services market as well. So, yeah, uh, the, the B Corp certification can be a powerful trigger for, for positive impact. So many great examples there across many different areas. And also you might think that Patagonia is so embedded, that established, but to see that they keep changing things is very motivating. And your example of basic, it, it helps you think, okay, well, if I was starting a business, what kind of standards would I want to put in place? And to your example about the production. So I imagine that your your day-to-day -day is just incredibly interesting and inspiring. I can't help but wonder what your personal journey into this space was. Could you share how you, because you're the founder, obviously, of Growth Basics. What's the story that led you to founding Growth Basics? Yeah, so I started my career, I actually started overseas because I, I took off right after university. And, uh, you know, like many Australians, thought I'd work a year or two overseas and then come home. And I ended up staying 14 years the first time. And I was very, very fortunate that I ended up, I started my career with Nike and ended up being with them for 10 years. And that took me to lots of different places. You know, I got to do jobs at country level, at regional level, and I had global roles as well. And that was, that was a phenomenal experience. And then I went on to Levi's where I was the brand director for Europe, Middle East and Africa, and then the global director for their premium segment. So I was incredibly fortunate that I had these amazing experiences. And when I came back to Australia, I would say my most satisfying roles were in private equity. So I was able to take all of that experience that I had built up in these global multinationals, all that incredible best practice around brand and product and, you know, operational efficiency. I, I managed business units at Nike, full, you know, P&L business units in the last few years that I was there. And at Levi's, you know, also was responsible across, you know, heading up brand across product and, and brand and communications. So I was able to take so much of that knowledge and apply it to my private equity gigs, helping businesses like Sheridan, 
and Jalik exit have have excellent exit outcomes. So yeah, you know, it was a really great way to, to apply my experience. And I also did other C-suite roles in Australia in retail and consumer goods. So that had always been sort of my my area. But actually, it was whilst I was at Jolique, I started to have my purpose epiphany, as I call it. <laughs> uh, I did a couple of things. I did the AICD company directors course. And I thought the first really good entry for me would be starting on some not-for-profit boards and seeing if I could apply my strategic capability to, to enabling those businesses or those organizations to do well. And I joined two boards. I joined the Board of Dress for Success which is all about economic empowerment of women through dressing and career services. And I also joined the board of Stretcher Family, a foster agency working in, the, in that space. And I think that's where I first started to think about, you know, connecting the dots between, between business capability and NGOs and, and thinking about how that sort of started to work. But also at Jolique, I was also asked to chair the CSR council to set one up and to chair one. The, the CEO asked me to do that. And I had to do a bit of a deep dive. I started reading books. And I, there was one book in particular that really influenced me at the time called Conscious Capitalism, written by John Mackey, who was the founder of Whole Foods Supermarkets, which eventually exited to Amazon, you know, a little bit further down the track. And, but a whole, a whole bunch of other books as well. And I, I guess I just had this epiphany around, well, how about how business can actually be a force for good, you know, and how can I take all of this knowledge that I've built over the years that was all around delivering commercial success and still deliver commercial success, but also create positive outcomes for other stakeholders. And that just flicked a switch for me. So I've, you know, really maintained my board work in the not-for-profit sector as much as possible because I found that very gratifying being able to apply my, my skill set to those organisations. But also I just thought, well, how do I make this a career as well? You know, how do I? So, you know, successively in all of, all of my successive jobs, I always thought about CSR, which is now called ESG, and how to incorporate that. But it wasn't until... I found, co-founded the Growth Activists with my business partners that I thought about, well, how do we actually create a consulting practice that has purpose and, and business as a force for good deeply embedded in the philosophy and in the practice and, and how we work with organizations. So yeah, that, that's kind of how it came about five years ago. A superb trajectory. And I'm wondering if there's a similarity between brand building for the world's best brands, Nike and Levi's, and to possibly what you're seeing now, the benefit of being B Corp certified for brands. Are there some similarities? Look, I think I think there are. I think, you know, I, I think the best brands always look at how they, it, it's really, it's about the proof points, really. And I think the best brands always have very deep authenticity. You know, a Nike or a Levi's, they've always really grounded their communication in in what makes them credible. You know, for Nike, it's performance and for Levi's, it's, you know, it's heritage and the history of having you know, done, ha, you know, have been, having been the inventors of the category and and continuously innovating in that category. And so there's something real and, and genuine and authentic. And I think that's what I see in the B Corp certification because it, it's about evidence. You know, it's not about virtue signaling. It's not about a little bit of, you know, great, it's, not, it's not about greenwashing. It's real. You know, you have to have this very real, genuine proof that that's where I see the similarities. It does make for, you know, really good practice because it is, yeah, grounded in something so real. It's authentic. Like you say, a proof point you can trust in this. Very interesting. What an amazing life that you had. Where was the Nike head office, may I ask? So I started in their Italian office in, in a place called Veggio Emilia. And then I moved to the Amsterdam, Amsterdam European headquarters. And then I had a couple of global roles that meant I spent a bit of time in Portland, Oregon as well. So yeah, which is where global headquarters were. And, and I actually spent a lot of time there in global roles, flying there pretty much every every once a month for a very long time. So well, that yeah, was very that glamorous. Was, I was the girl. 
Oh, and so and I was the girl with the most frequent flyer points, but but yeah, it wasn't glamorous at all. <laughs> no, Too many in-flight meals and snacks at the airport that don't make you feel no. so great. So you mentioned no. your purpose epiphany, and I absolutely love that saying. What was your epiphany, and was it actually? Did it take a lot of courage to then take the jump to go from very established businesses into founding? your own very much which was very much based on purpose yeah it kind of felt quite natural I think I always want to be really honest around some of the more negative experiences that led me to start the business as well there was also an element of disillusionment with the corporate corporate Australia as well you know there's certainly an element of the you know the pale male stale brigade you know, running things. And certainly that, you know, it was when I first moved back to Australia in 2005, after being away for a very long time, that was, you know, really, really obvious, really alive and well. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I often felt that decisions were being made through maybe not the most human centric filters. And there was definitely something in me that thought, well, you know, the best way to change this is, is, you know, by not working within the system, at least for me, I thought, you know, consulting and helping them see that and helping, I guess, multiple businesses versus just one, I can have a bigger impact that way. So that was definitely a driver as well. I think it's really important to say, you know, I really struggled. There was a point where I was like, well, you know, I've got an amazing CV. I've worked for these incredible businesses. Who do I really want to work for? And I was really struggling to identify. I, I remember having the conversation actually with a with an executive recruitment firm and they said, well, why don't you make a bit of a list of the businesses you'd really like to work for? And I was like, I, I'm really struggling. <laughs> Maybe overseas I could, but I couldn't, you know, couldn't really think of one. And I think that's different now. I think, you know, yeah, I think now there are a whole bunch of organisations that are doing amazing things, but at the time... I thought, well, maybe the best thing for me is to actually do my own, my own thing for a little while. Yeah. And I think Australia has benefited because I do think it's very helpful to bring this outside perspective. That is also, it's a depth of experience as well. It's not just a fleeting one year. You had a depth of experience that then you could bring back to various organizations here, which does definitely add value. Obviously we're talking about fire and forte and I'm already identifying this fire and strength, which is very purpose-driven, then also taking the courage to then act on it. Does the idea around finding this purpose and acting on it in your 40s, does that resonate with you? Oh, definitely, definitely. And I was in my late 40s when I started started the growth activist. It absolutely does. I look at younger generations and I think that they are doing it, you know, at much younger ages than, than I did. There was... You know, I I think I, you know, for a long time, I was kind of in, you know, this kind of, you know, what was expected. I was on the pathway of what was expected and what, you know, was seen as a, as a good traditional career path. And I think breaking out of that and challenging that and starting my own business and, you know, kind of finding this, you know, inner fire to do something a little bit different. Yeah, it didn't come to me till, you know, till my mid to late 40s. Whereas I think a lot of younger people are doing it very, very early. And I love that. You know, I feel like that they're finding this space and they're going on entrepreneurial journeys much, much earlier. Yeah. So, yeah, that definitely resonates with me. Absolutely. That, yeah. I, and I'm seeing so many amazing women in their 40s and 50s starting new businesses. And I do think there's a benefit there as well because of the fact that we have all of this experience that we can apply. And I think there's lots of stats out there as well about startups and the success rates of startups. And they are much more successful when they're started by people who are further on in their career journey. So yeah, it just shows that we're really leveraging that experience in a in an effective way, I guess. Indeed, the average age of an entrepreneur now is forty-two. Female entrepreneur is forty-two, oh. and that, oh, there you go. I did not know that. It really talks to what you reference there, which is utilizing experience, but also seeing what the world needs and seeing where you can add value. And I think that by identifying businesses, B Corp practices or how they can be B Corp 
certified and then also encouraging this innovation between them you're certainly doing that and I think it's a really great example and actually to be honest sounds like you've got the dream job so let's wait for some CVs to come into the growth activists which on that <laughs> which on that point I wanted to know if someone was listening to this and thinking I am so motivated by making the world a better place you mentioned the five areas you might need to remind me of what they are community environment that are under B Corp if someone had heard that and thought, I would love to work in that space in one of those pillars, but maybe they've they've had 20 years in another career, what advice could you give them about the kind of skills and experience that they could maybe transfer over or that they might need to acquire to do to move into that space? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm a really big believer that you have to skill up in in the, you know, in the ESG space. And you have to have a baseline understanding of the science, particularly in the ESG, when it comes to the environmental space as well, and really understand sort of the bigger, you know, the bigger dynamics. So I would say that's really important. And what's also really important is making sure that you're understanding it needs to come from the place of, of evidence and proof as well. And that that rigorous analysis and measurement is really, really important. And being able to develop a, a skill set in that space is is really is really important. Um, I think I think as ESG develops, we're going to be moving away from generalist roles to much more specialist roles. So you will have you'll have specialist comms people who are, you know, making sure that you're not greenwashing, but also making sure that they're communicating not just to customers, but to a bigger group of stakeholders. You'll have your environmental scientists within businesses who will be responsible for maintaining environmental management systems across carbon, water, waste, energy, biodiversity impacts. So, you know, we're, we're going to move away from, I guess, there will be definitely room for generalists and having chief sustainability officers or sustainability managers, but in large organisations, there will certainly be more specialist roles. Certainly the one that has always been there has been that corporate function of reporting, you know, corporate comms and, and the sort of investor community reporting. That will continue to become, I think, more onerous as well as, as the regulatory environment changes. So there's a whole range of different areas people can go into. But I think what is really important is to get that systems thinking going and understanding that there's a huge interconnectivity between all of the components of ESG. I think, you know, one of my one of one term that I'm that's really resonating with me is that it's not E, it's not ESG, but E ESG. So it's it's about economy environment, social and governance, and that they are all really powerfully interlinked. So I think having that sort of big picture understanding before you go down into any of the specialist areas is really important. And understanding, you know, just the, the principles that to really drive change, you do need to be a system thinker and, and think about the interconnectivity within organizations, but even externally between governments, NGOs, businesses, academia, and pulling all of those pieces together. So I think I've answered the question. Absolutely. There's a lot of, there's plenty of reading and research to do, but there's also a lot of resources out there from what I can see. And from what yeah. you're talking about, I'm thinking that there's not a day that goes past where it's not in the media, something to do with ESG or EESG and businesses putting investment behind certain technologies. So would beginning with reading and getting that kind of broad idea and understanding be a good start point? Definitely, definitely. I think, you know, there there are, you know, a bunch of different, you know, di different newsletters and things that people can can subscribe to. Bloomberg Green is something that, you know, lands in my inbox every day. There's sustainability today. So there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of really great resources out there that you can either follow via email or follow on LinkedIn as well. I think if you can encourage your organisation to join the Global Compact Network for Australia, that they have an incredible online library of short courses that are included as part of membership. That's something I'm always, we're members and it's something I'm always encouraging my team to do to cycle through all of those courses. 
um, it's a relatively small investment for, you know, for a small business to become an annual member and then to have access to all of those courses. And then there's a whole plethora of other courses that are available and increasingly specialist as well. So there's, there's, there's lots and lots available for sure. And I think just understanding sort of bigger, there's conferences to attend as well. So many more conferences than even just a couple of years ago. In a couple of weeks, I'll be speaking, and they're becoming more specialists as well. I'll be, I'll be speaking. I'll be moderating a panel actually on B Corp at the Sustainable Retail Go Conference, and that's all about sustainability just for retail and consumer goods. So yeah, yeah, that that that's where I would start. Excellent. I will link the the references, especially the mailing, the newsletters that you can subscribe to to this. And can you just remind me those five areas that come under B Corp again? Okay, so they are governance, environment, community, customer, and workers. Excellent. So if you're particularly interested in one of those areas, once getting a broader understanding, you might want to then go down one of those routes. And I thought it was quite interesting when you said, look, corporate comms is quite established, but every area will need to have more ESG focus. So maybe you work in HR at the moment, but you want to actually see how it can turn into a more sustainability role where you're looking after workers I suppose you could then look at it with that lens is that correct definitely and I think particularly for organizations that are undergoing sustainability transformation exercises where they're in the process of doing the measurement doing the implementation putting all of those measurements and processes in place we always encourage our clients to build cross-functional teams because what you want to do is build capability and knowledge all the way across the organization because sustainability is, you know, good sustainability practice is about everybody in every function making day-to-day -day decisions through that filter. It's just going to be an essential skill for every role. So I think the more that organizations can expose multiple functions to uh, ESG projects, the, the better in terms of, of building that really broad skill and particularly on transformation projects, because then you, you know, you, at the end of the project, you're really end, ending up with these, I guess, you know, ambassadors for the work that has just been done, you know, sort of knowledge points of reference all the way through the organization. So yeah, there is so much, you know, someone in HR there is so much to deep dive in. Every time we work with, you know, people and culture teams, they're always having a discovery around things that, yeah, they they just didn't realize that they could be doing to enhance their practices to be even more inclusive and even more just. It's great that this touches so many areas. We th often think of sustainability as just being the environment, but actually it's extremely holistic by the sounds of it. And that's also really helpful that no matter what role you're in, you could maybe look a little bit further ahead and think where might ESG impact my role? Where might I want to direct my role if I have some kind of agency in that as well? Rosanna, thank you so much for your time and for just really opening our eyes to the many opportunities that we can move into in this space. It's been incredibly helpful. So we really appreciate you sharing all of that with you with us. And all the very best with the growth activists. We can't wait to see the work that you get up to next. Thank you so much, Hannah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Take care. See you very soon. You too. Thank you. Bye.